chapter of the New Testament book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4, amen. The book of Ephesians is just after the book of Galatians, just before the book of Philippians, one of the uh, prison epistles of the Apostle Paul, Ephesians chapter 4, and I want to begin reading with verse 7. I'm going to read through verse 16. I'm reading from the New King James Version of the Holy Book. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 7 through 16. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he said, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this, he ascended, what does it mean but that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness by which they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share and causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. May God's richest blessing be to his red word, may it be sanctified in our hearts. Let's bow for prayer, shall we? Father, we're so grateful for this one more opportunity to gather together at this place that has been hallowed and consecrated and set apart for the worship of the true and the living God, his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the help of the Holy Spirit. We thank you for those, Lord Father, who by faith have risen this morning and prepared themselves and presented themselves to you as living sacrifices, holy, acceptable unto you with your reasonable service. Now we pray, Lord God, that their coming will have not been in vain that you would meet the spiritual needs that your people have today for encouragement, for hope, Father, for direction, for insight, and for perspective. And may we all leave this place being able to say that we've heard a word from God today. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I want to speak to you this morning as long as my allergies and my sinuses hold out, uh, from the subject of equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. Equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. Will everybody say, for the work of the ministry. <laughs> for the work of the ministry. We're grateful to the Lord that you're here uh, this morning and uh, as I'll share with you last week, for the next couple of weeks, we're going to just be sharing some topical messages that will hopefully bring some perspective to where we are as the Grace Bible Church family, and some insight as to where we believe that God may be leading us uh, at this time. And I'm, I'm just greatly encouraged for some unknown reason. I believe that God has something special uh, for us to do. And I believe he has brought us to this place for this work uh, at this time. A few weeks ago, I shared with you back in the middle of uh, September that I was celebrating my 25th year of a, of a pulpit ministry. And so 25 years ago, minus a couple of weeks, you guys had the audacity to license me to preach and turn me loose uh, on this city with the gospel. For that, I am grateful. And so this morning, you know, I celebrate 16 years of being here at the Grace Bible Church. I was just a young man when I came <laughs> I was just a young man when I came with a full head of hair and jerry curl locks down on my shoulders. Uh, but it seems like it's only been yesterday. Uh, but 16 years have passed and many people have come and many people have left. And some of our faithful saints, they have went on to the other side to prepare 
to wait for us to come that they might receive their, their reward for serving the Lord. And now we're still here left and we remain to do the work that God has called for us to do. And so I want to put some things in, in a context this morning for the next couple of weeks as we look at really just trying to rediscover what does it really mean to be the church? What does it mean to be the church, the body of Christ, the continuation of the life of the Lord Jesus Christ in a city, in a neighborhood, on a block, or on a street? And what does that really mean? And what are the ramifications for us in the 21st century, in the most sophisticated, most highly technically advanced, most complicated society in the history of the human experience and experiment? What does it mean for us? And how do we seize the opportunity that God has presented us to really serve him faithfully and to lift up that blood-stained banner and to lift up the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and to appeal and to plead with men and women, boys and girls to repent and believe the gospel and trust Christ? And how do we discharge ministry that is relevant, that really speak to the felt needs of the people of the day? Well, I believe the, the Bible is God's word, and it speaks to us with perennial freshness and with clarion clarity. The word of God is never outdated. And so as we continue to go through the old book, God, through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, can take the timeless principles that are contained in God's word. He can reveal them to us. He can illuminate our eyes, our minds, that we might be to see how we're to live the faith out in the context in which we find ourselves today. So we go back to the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4, and I've shared with you before, this is one of the most powerful books in all of the New Testament because the church at Ephesus may have been the most theologically advanced because the Apostle Paul spent more time at Ephesus than he spent at any other church. So he poured him life, his life into people at Ephesus for over a period of three years. So he gave them instruction that no other church received. And now you can look at by the content of the book of Ephesians, which has some of the most complicated theological doctrine, predestination, foreordination, election, the mystery of the church. Some of these doctrines that contain the book of Ephesians are not contained in any other book of the Bible. So Paul had the confidence that they had the spiritual maturity to be able to discern and to receive and to wrestle with some of these complicated truths that they needed to understand to be able to fully live out their faith in the Ephesian society. Ephesus was a port city. It was a cosmopolitan city. It was a sophisticated city. It was as complex as the city of Rome. And so all of the challenges that you'd find in a major metropolitan uh, community of that day you found at the church at Ephesus. And so Paul wanted to make sure that this church would, was equipped with the spiritual tools and the resources that they needed to speak powerfully and clearly to the issues of the day. So they had to understand who they were in Christ. So as Ephesians 4 opens, Paul says in verse 1 of Ephesians 4, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you, I plead with you that you walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness and long suffering, bearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There's one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. So just as Paul is weaving into the text in 1 Corinthians 12 that we looked at last week, this idea of the diversity in the body of Christ, but the unity of the body of Christ, and the harmony in the body of Christ, and the oneness of the body of Christ, that's the same theme that Paul weaves in these first six verses in the book of Ephesians 4. That there is but one Lord, there is one faith, there is one baptism, there is one calling, there is one God who is above all, in all, and through us all, and he knits us all together. So there is no problem that is too complicated for God to solve. There's no difference there's no division, there's no tension, there's no heart feeling that is too great for God to solve. If we're all trying to seek him and serve him and be filled with the Spirit of the Lord, God can inform each of us and he can calibrate our individual hearts and our individual minds where that we can find 